Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is Charles Nesbitt, Jr. Welcome to you, all of you who are joining us for our midweek Bible study. Let me begin by saying that today's lesson, while it is a new lesson, is pre-recorded. I am not teaching this lesson live. I have pre-recorded what you are about to see and hear. And so for all of you who have been connecting, are connecting now, and for all of those who will connect, I am not doing this lesson live. I have pre-recorded this new lesson for this week, and I'm very happy that you have joined us. This is our midweek, midday Bible study on Facebook Live, and I appreciate all of you who are part of the Providence family and all of you who are friends of ours from um, around the metro Atlanta area and across the country. We're always getting individuals from Illinois and Virginia and Texas and New York and some other places. I appreciate you. And for those of you who do not turn on notifications and who do not notify us that you are connected, I appreciate you very much too. Anyway, again, I remind you, this lesson today is not being taught live. It is a pre-recorded lesson. So I am um, unaware of those of you who are notifying us of your presence, but nevertheless happy to have you with us anyway. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for another day, for blessings and grace. We thank you for the privilege of connecting virtually today, for all of those who are already with us coming into the room, and for those who are on their way to connecting, God. We pray that you would take what is said and done today, that you would advance your kingdom, that you would be glorified, uh, that we would be edified by it, God, not only in our knowledge and understanding, but also in the application of your word. We love you, God, and we say thank you for what you are about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you. I, again, I appreciate you. I remind you this is not live right now. I pre-recorded this lesson for us just a few days ago, uh, but it is a new lesson. We are focusing today and I hope that you saw a reference to it on our Facebook page or heard a reference to it uh, in Sunday worship on 2 Kings chapter number 6. 2 Kings chapter number 6, verses 8 through 23. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 23. Let me begin with this thought. Very often, in our contemporary world, one of the things that the church fails to do, fails to do, is point those who are part of the body of Christ to the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Often we fail to point believers to the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. And that's a result of the fact that we compartmentalize Jesus uh, where we're in we refer to our relationship with the Lord in ways that seem to suggest that there are some things beyond him beyond Christ and our relationship with him that's what we're talking about today the all sufficiency of Christ and to see in scripture, by a particular example today, our failure to see the Lord as sufficient for everything we need. Uh, what we do is we say, okay, it, it reminds me something of something a woman said in a church meeting some years ago that I was in. She said, church is church and business is business. And I quickly disagreed because for us, the Lord is all things and he is in all things. You don't, you don't separate the worship on Sunday from how you conduct the church's business during the week. 
if he is Lord of all, then you cannot compartmentalize your relationship with the Lord and say, okay, I'm going in this room, but ain't no need me taking him in there with me because he's not connected to what I'm about to be involved in. No, that's not the way that we are to treat our relationship with the Lord. We regard Christ as all sufficient for us. And so whether I'm sitting in the sanctuary worshiping, publicly worshiping with you, or walking out in the street. He is sufficient for everything. He is sufficient. He is sufficient for my life physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually. He is sufficient for all of those things. If I got a problem at the job, I don't say business is business and church is church. If I got a problem at the job, his sufficiency is enough that if I apply his word to my workplace, then I can worship him as much at work as I do when I'm seated with you here in the building. So that's, that's one of the uh, things that the church fails to do sometimes. We start recommending recipes and resources for people sometimes that have nothing to do with the Lord as if there is an area of our experience that is outside of God's boundaries. Y'all see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. He is all sufficient, so let us not compartmentalize the Lord as if there, is some, as if there are some things beyond Him. He is, he is our main resource. In reality, He's our only resource and he therefore is our ultimate resource. That's why, you know, I did a series not too long ago on all of the I am statements of John's gospel. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, I am living water. Jesus says all of the I am statements in John's gospel in order to convey his sufficiency. So if he says, I am, he's not just saying I am in a particular situation or on a particular day. He's saying, I am whatever you need for me to be. Whatever resource you need, I am that. I'm, I'm, I'm your light. I am, I am your shepherd. I am your God. God, whatever you need me to be, Jesus says, I am that. So he is our ultimate and only resource. So then, if he is all sufficient, and we're still in our introduction here, if he is all sufficient, then we must direct ourselves and those who are part of the family of God along with us to faith and to prayer. Faith and prayer. Those two resources lead us to him and to what he has in terms of provision for us when it comes to our circumstances and our experiences. We must always direct ourselves and others who are part of this family to faith and prayer. To suggest, to suggest that there is something outside of the Lord that is better than the Lord is to make Christ peripheral. To make him peripheral means you put him on the edge. There's some other stuff at the center that you are regarding with uh, more esteem than the Lord whenever you put the Lord on the periphery. If he's on the periphery, that means you might get to him or you might not. But if he's at the center, if, that's, if, if you consider him to be all sufficient and he's at the center, that means that your life is literally revolving around him because he is your S-U-N and you are, one of, you are one of the worlds revolving around him and taking your cues from him. So don't forget now, if we are to make Christ all sufficient or to regard him as all sufficient, don't forget that we have riches in Christ because of our relationship with him riches in him we have the riches of scripture or the word of God we have the riches of prayer a line of communication 
with the Father that has been made, made available to us by the Son. That's why we call the Son's name at the end of the prayer. In Jesus' name, we pray. We also have um, uh, the riches of the Holy Spirit who resides within us, who gives us cues, who gives us understanding, who brings us comfort, who reminds us that we have something in the Lord that cannot be taken away. All sufficiency in Christ. Let me read something for you from Acts 2. Acts 2, beginning with verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Listen to this. This is, the, this is the church, the first church of the New Testament. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Y'all see what was happening? People were being blessed. The church was growing because people were finding sufficiency in Christ. That's what that says in Acts 2, 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayer. And because they devoted themselves to that, because they made Christ preeminent, because they regarded him as all sufficient, they experienced certain blessings uh, in their lives such that they didn't have any needs that were not met. All of their needs were met because they found sufficiency in Christ. Okay? All right, let's move. Let's go to 2 Kings 6. And let me read a story from 2 Kings 6, beginning with verse number 8. All right? Get there in your Bible, 2 Kings 6, 8 through 23. I hope you read it before today. 2 Kings 6, beginning with verse 8. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. Y'all see that? All right. After conferring with his officers, the king of Aram said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. So the Aramean king sets up his camp in a certain place so he can attack Israel. Verse 9, the man of God sent word to the king of Israel. So that means Elisha sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing a certain place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by Elisha. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. Y'all see what's happening so far? There are enemies trying to, um, trying to destroy Israel, but every time they make a plan, God tells Israel's prophet Elisha, and Elisha tells Israel's king. So the king ends up being informed about what the enemies are doing without the enemy knowing it. Now, verse 11 this enraged the king of Aram. So the king of Aram got mad about what was happening. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha the prophet who is in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Y'all see that? Y'all see that? Okay. Verse 13, go find out where he is, the king ordered. So I can send men and capture him. So the king of Aram wants to send men to capture Elisha because Elisha, Elisha's been telling Israel's king, king, the king of Aram's secrets. The report came back. He is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. So the soldiers from Aram surrounded the city Dothan. When the servant of the man of God got up, one of Elisha's servants got up, went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. He said that to Elisha. Don't be afraid, Elisha answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Those who are with us is the sufficiency of God. That's what Elisha is saying. 
Verse 17, and Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. So you got these horses and chariots of fire encircling the city along with the soldiers from Aram who were down on the ground. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered, verse 16, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. What did the young servant see? He looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told him, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me. So they're blind. And Elisha said, let me tell y'all where to go. And I will lead you to the man you're looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. Then when the king of Israel saw them, he, he said to Elisha, Shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, Elisha answered. Would you kill those you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Y'all see that? I sure hope y'all read that before today so that you were even more familiar with it as we read that passage today. That's 2 Kings 6, 8 through 23. So what, basically what happens is Elisha and all of his servant prophets were surrounded in Dothan by a foreign army. The servant comes out and sees the enemy soldiers out there waiting to take them captive, runs back in, in panic, in a state of panic to Elisha and says to him in verse number 15, what shall we do? He says, oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? Now, remember, all of us have been in emergency situations. All of us, at least once in our lives, have panicked or felt panic over something that we believed we had no control over. We've all had emergencies, at least in our opinion or in our estimation, we have all had emergencies. And when those emergencies came, situations that we felt we had no control over, we have all been tempted to panic. Look at verse number 16 of 2 Kings 6. Don't be afraid, Elisha answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Y'all see that? Elisha says to the servant, don't panic, don't be afraid. There's something that you are unaware of right now. Yes, the enemy down there is real, but we have a resource that they don't see and that you don't see. What we have what we have in verse 16, Elisha says, is those who are with us are more than those who are with them. That's Elijah's response to the young servant. What's his response? Listen, he says, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then in verse 17, Elisha says, Lord, please open this young man's eyes. The Lord opens his eyes. He saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Y'all see that? So Elisha says, don't panic. Don't be afraid. We got a resource here that you are unaware of at the moment. Why? Because the resource came from an unseen world. It wasn't something that was visible to the natural or physical eye. It was only visible to those who were looking at the situation or circumstance through the eye of the spirit, which is what Elisha alone was doing at the moment. He was seeing what was going on, not just in the physical world, 
but in the spiritual. I see the enemy down there on the ground around us, but I also see the resource of God, which is here to protect us from, as the old folk used to say, hurt, harm, and danger. So there was something going on in the unseen world that the young servant could not see until Elisha prayed for him to see it. Okay? All right. So from that text, 2 Kings 6, 8 through 23, we have two themes that we want to examine in that text in our study today. Those two themes are the all-sufficiency of God, the all-sufficiency of God, he's got everything you need, and prayer as an access to that sufficiency. Those two themes in this text, what did I say? Number one, the all-sufficiency of God. Number two, prayer as access to that sufficiency. So I want to suggest something to you today. Stuff is going to happen. It's already happened in our lives in the past. We will continue to be faced with situations that would tempt us to panic, but I don't want you to panic. Rather than panic, pray. Because when you pray, prayer will give you peace. Panic will not. Prayer will give you peace. Panic will not. So pray rather than panic. And I'm not saying that's easy to do. That's really hard to do. You have to You've got to make yourself do some things, you know, in certain situations. You've got to say certain things to yourself. You've got to remind yourself of certain truths over and over again so that you pray rather than panic. Okay? All right. Here's our first thought. God is our all-sufficient resource in times of trial. Okay? That's our first thought. Coming out of this text, God is our all-sufficient resource in times of trial. Why is he that? Because he's got everything we need. That's why he's all-sufficient. He's got the knowledge. Y'all got that? He's got the power. And he's sovereign. Knowledge, power, sovereignty. He's got all of those things that makes him all-sufficient for us. Knowledge, power, and and sovereignty. And those three things, knowledge, power, and sovereignty, dominate this story. In this story, we see God having the knowledge. We see God showing the power, and we see God doing it according to his own will. So knowledge, power, and sovereignty dominate the story. There's another thing to note. No name is mentioned here in this text in 2 Kings 6 other than Elisha's. And that's important because if Elisha is the, and, and listen, um, there, are, there are examples in this text where a, the reference to Elisha is not by his name, but in verse number nine it says, the man of God sent word to the king of Israel. That's the beginning of verse nine. The man of God is Elisha. So what we got going on in this text is a reminder that this is all about God. We ain't even calling Elisha's name a whole lot. We ain't called the servant's name. We haven't called the king of Aram's name. Y'all notice that? We've been saying the man of God or the king of Aram. And it's because this text encourages us to focus on God as our sufficiency. Elijah's name comes up a couple of times, two or three times. But even in this text, he's not always referred to by his name. In some instances, he's referred to as the man of God. So God is all sufficient. And we can see that by the way names are placed in this text in 2 Kings 6, 8 through 23. It helps us to focus on God alone. Okay, now let's expand we're doing fairly well. I'm, we've been doing this 24 minutes from what my uh, iPad says. Let's expand on the fact that God is all-sufficient. Number one, that means that God is omniscient. He knows all things. Listen, what are you, what are you saying when you're saying God is omniscient? He's all-sufficient because one, he is omniscient. What does omniscient mean? He knows all, but listen, he not only knows all, 
He possesses the wisdom to apply what he knows. There are some folk that know some stuff but don't know what to do with it. But we can never accuse God of not knowing what he needs to know and not being able to apply what he knows. Look at verse number 12 of 2 Kings 6. The king of Aram was mad because he didn't know who was telling his secrets to the king of Israel. What did I say, uh, say to you? Verse number 12, when he accused one of them, they said, it wasn't any of us, my lord the king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Elisha wasn't in the man's bedroom. Elisha didn't live near the man, but Elisha had a relationship with God where his communication line was so open that God was filling Elisha in on what Elisha needed to know because, he, because God knew everything that the king of Aram was doing and was going to do. Y'all see that in verse 12? They said, it wasn't none of us, king. <laughs> There's a prophet. There's a man of God who knows what you're doing, and he's telling your strategy to the king of Israel. Uh, let me read Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4, verse number 13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Y'all see what he says? He says there is nothing in creation that's hidden from God's sight. God has uncovered everything. He has laid bare before his own eyes everything, and we must give an account to him. Y'all see that? That's Hebrews 4 verse 13. So what's going on here? with the king of Aram is that he and his people are learning um, uh, that, that God knows all things, that God is aware of all things. And part of the reason that we are reading in the scripture what God knows about is for the, for the purpose of glorifying God or exposing the fact that there isn't anything that one can hide from God. Even the enemies of God's people in this text are discovering that, the Israel, that Israel's God knows all, and because he does, um, he can pass on information that's necessary to keep his children safe. You know, see what I'm saying? So the fact that God is all-sufficient implies that God is omniscient, that he knows all things and he possesses the wisdom to apply it. But there's another thing that comes out of this God being all sufficient because it ain't enough if he just knows all things and has wisdom. This text also reminds us that God is omnipotent. So not only does God know all things and have the wisdom to apply those things that he knows, he has the power to solve the situation. So he's got the knowledge, the wisdom, but he also has the power to solve situations. Let me read something for you. Uh, Psalm 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Listen to Psalm 27 and verse 3. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. Y'all see that? That's in Psalm 27, uh, verse 3, Psalm 34, and verse number 7. So, not only does God have the knowledge and the wisdom to apply the knowledge, he has the power to solve the problems that he knows about, and the wisdom that comes attached to it, he has the power to solve situations. Y'all see that? He's omnipotent. I was reading a story about a great preacher from the past, G. Campbell Morgan. He used to pastor in, in London. Uh, a woman asked G. Campbell Morgan whether we should pray about, should we even take 
little things to God? Should we just take the big stuff to God in prayer? And his answer was, is there anything that's big to God? That was his answer. Her question, should we take to God only the big stuff? His answer was, is there anything that's big to God? Perfect answer, because if he's all sufficient, then nothing is big to him. If, if, there is, if there's nothing beyond the boundary of his power to affect and to change, then nothing is big to God. There's just no, you know, that episode where Jacob is wrestling with the angel of the Lord, you know, the angel just touched him on his hip and he, he limped from that time forward in the, for the rest of his life. That wasn't, that wasn't, you know, God having to deal with something that was hard for him to handle. That was God showing grace uh, to, the, to the fighting spirit of Jacob when they were wrestling all night. You know, the angel just finally at a point said, okay, I'm going to touch you and you're going to limp for the rest of your life. But you put up a good fight because you put up a good fight, <laughs> you're going to get a blessing. But, you know, you ain't even have the power to deal with me. I could have defeated you any time at all. Um, but there was there's some things that you needed to understand and to experience. And um, that's why I wrestled with you all night long. Okay, y'all see that? So he's omniscient. If he's all right, we had a little technical problem. I hope that I've got it solved for you, but we're in the middle of our study. Uh, we've been talking about the fact that God is all sufficient. Three components to his sufficiency. One, he's omniscient. We talked about that already. Secondly, he's omnipotent. We talked about that already. Third component of God's all sufficiency for us is that God sovereignly protects his own according to his will. God sovereignly protects his own according to his will. What does that mean? If you are his, if you are God's child, you can trust him to provide. You can trust him to provide. Let me read Psalm 91 verse number 11. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. If you are God's child, you can trust him to provide. And keep this in mind, this really, we really need this truth to encourage us. He is always providing for his children in unseen ways, which is why we need to make application of our faith and pray rather than panic. He's always doing it in unseen ways. What happened in the passage we were reading in 2 Kings 6, 8 through 23? First of all, we saw Elisha's servant asleep. This servant is sleeping, and while he's sleeping, the enemy is camping round about him. Then we see him awake, but he's also unaware in his waking state, in his sleeping state, he's unaware that the enemy's around. In his wake state, he's unaware that God has provided protection for him and Elijah and all of the other young prophets at the prophet's school. Now, there's another thing to keep in mind, and that is where this happened. It happened in a city called Dothan. What is Dothan? Dothan is the place where Joseph found his brothers. Let's read Genesis 37 and verse number 17. When Joseph was looking for his brothers before they sold him into slavery, he asked a man about where they were. And the man says to Joseph, Genesis 37, verse 17, they have moved on from here. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. Y'all see that? Dothan's the place where Joseph met his brothers and from which they ended up selling him into slavery. But even though Dothan was a terrible place in terms of the experience that Joseph had in Dothan, 
What does Joseph say after looking back at his life in Genesis 50 and verse 20? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So Dothan is a place where Joseph had a bad experience, but God was working in that experience to get Joseph ready for what God had in mind for Joseph. So in the same way, the, the enemies are camped round about Elisha and his prophets in Dothan, but God was working in an unseen way also in that situation. So what happened with the servant? The servant ends up being safe with Elisha because Elisha knows some stuff that the servant doesn't know until Elisha prayed for him to see it, which means that the servant, although he was panicking, was safe because he was with his master. And that's what I need for all of us to remember when we are in situations in which we are tempted to panic that we are safe because we are with our master and he has promised to be with us always even until the end of the age, okay? All right, so first truth, God is all sufficient. How is that played out in this text in 2 Kings 6? God is omniscient, God is omnipotent, and God sovereignly protects his own. Secondly, from this text, and let's see, we've got a little bit more time left. Prayer, we know, we know first of all that God is all sufficient. The second component of this study is prayer is the way to have peace. Not panic. Prayer is the way to have peace when trials come. Why? because prayer is our access to God and to God's will for us. Prayer is our access to God and to his will for us. Let me read for you Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God and the peace of God. This is the result which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You'll see that. Don't be anxious, Paul says, not about anything, but in each one of those situations, through prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God and you will end up with the peace that surpasses all understanding. Y'all see that? So prayer is the way to have peace when trials come because it's our access to God and his will for us. Now this text shows us how uncertain life can be because Elisha and all the young prophets are asleep and the enemy is surrounding them and it can happen like that to any of us at any time. So it is foolish to live thinking that there is no eternity when life in a physical, earthly way can be so short. We must remind ourselves to live in dependence on God because none of us knows what a day will bring. Second component is prayer, right? Now, let's look at three things about prayer. One, prayer will replace panic with wisdom. See, when you panic, you don't know what to do. When you pray, prayer will replace panic with wisdom for you to live skillfully when you're in the midst of your trials. What's the contrast? The contrast is between Elisha and his servant. The servant sees the enemies. He runs in, what we gonna do? What we gonna do? And Elisha replies to the servant, listen, don't worry about it. Where are we? Verse number 16, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. So the panic of the servant is met by the, the calm and prayerful spirit of the prophet. And the prophet says, I don't want you to be concerned or worried. What we got going for us is greater than what's going on against us outside surrounding the city. So prayer replaces panic with wisdom for trials. Contrast. Servant is panicking. Elisha has prayed. So Elisha approaches the servant with peace in his spirit because his praying spirit has led him 
to have a supernatural knowledge. What does he say? He said, man, um, just look up. What does he say? He says, Father, please open the young man's eyes, deal with his panic, and give him peace. So that helps in terms of the contrast between the servant and the prophet Elijah. And remember, Elisha had Elijah as his mentor. So when Elisha saw Elijah do stuff like praying and fire falling from the sky, Elisha learned from his mentor Elijah that he could trust God. And because of that praying spirit that Elisha had, God kept Elisha informed about everything Elisha needed to know. I would suggest then that we would pray more often than we do so that we might keep the line open and receive what God has to say. Look at, um, let's see, 2 Kings 6, beginning with verse 21. When the king of Israel saw them, meaning the enemies and the fact that Elisha had led the enemy to Samaria, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them, and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Look at how God said to treat the enemy. Give them something to eat and send them back because they've learned a valuable lesson. They've learned that your God, Elisha, is in control. That I've got the knowledge, I've got the power, I've got the presence, I've got the sovereignty to make sure that you have everything you need. So God says, I can deal. That means that you and I can deal with enemies differently. You don't have to destroy your enemies. You just need to walk in the power of the promise of God and let God fight for you. Because if the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, then God may be trying to win some people that you're trying to get rid of because they are your enemies. But maybe if you prayed, and walked in the power of God in their presence, it would make a difference. Y'all see that? Okay. So prayer is the way to have peace, not panic, because prayer replaces panic with wisdom. If you pray, God will provide answers. When we pray, God gives us unusual wisdom. Proverbs. I want to read something for you for, from Proverbs one. Let's see where it is here. Proverbs 1, beginning with verse 20. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. Who is making it? Wisdom. Wisdom is calling who? Calling us. Wisdom says, how long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? So wisdom is crying out to us. When we pray, God provides us with wisdom. He gives us unusual wisdom. But what this passage in Proverbs 1 suggests is you have to get your wisdom before your trials so that you're in position to apply that wisdom in your trials. It is important when we come into situations like this servant seeing the enemies around them that we act on what we know. When you act on what you know, when you make application, when you live skillfully, when you, um, <clears throat> when you exercise wisdom based on the knowledge you have, that means that that wisdom has not gone to waste. Warnings are only profitable to us when we obey them, when we obey them, okay? So one, prayer replaces panic with wisdom. Two, prayer opens our eyes to spiritual realities. Prayer, what, what happened? What happened in the text in 2 Kings 6? Elisha prayed and a young man's eyes were open. 
So prayer doesn't just replace panic with wisdom like we see in Elisha. Prayer opens the eyes of God's children to spiritual realities. Now, we usually define realities by our natural senses. We see a thing, we smell a thing, we hear a thing, we touch a thing. That's how we identify that which we call real. I hear it, so it must be real. I see it, it must be real. I smell it, it must be real. I touch it, I taste it, it must be real. But what Elisha teaches us in this passage is that there are other realities. And that reality is a greater reality. The spiritual reality is greater than the physical reality. And what we saw in this text is what the young man saw when he saw the chariots of fire encircling where they were in Dothan, it wasn't that it just showed up then. They had been there all along. Elisha said, God, please show him what I've already seen. Please show him what's already been done. Please show him what he has not yet seen, but which has already been manifested here in Dothan. So the fact that the servant didn't see the chariots, the uh, fire, the chariots of fire, um, the fact that he didn't see them didn't mean they weren't real. It just meant he wasn't in position to see them because his faith was covered up by his fear. And Elisha had to help him remove that fear so that his faith could take control and he could see what God was really doing. So the spiritual reality is the ultimate reality because it's the reality that existed before the natural reality was created. You will see that? The spiritual reality is responsible for the physical reality and it therefore supersedes the physical reality. Let me read something for you from 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. How come we don't lose heart? Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So we okay, we good. Verse 17 is 2 Corinthians 4. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Y'all see? Okay, we're fixing our eyes on stuff. Let's go to Ephesians 6. And in, in um, Ephesians 6, verse number 12 says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. They have put, therefore put on the full armor, the whole armor of God. So there's unseen stuff. And in the unseen realm is where the ultimate realities are. Everything that we see, feel, hear is passing away. But God's got this thing under control because his reality is the greatest reality. What does prayer do? It opens our eyes to spiritual realities. Finally, we're saying that prayer is the key to have peace and not panic because prayer makes possible what is humanly impossible. Prayer makes possible what is humanly impossible. What was Elisha's prayer? Elisha's prayer was not that the young man would be able to take advantage of a talent he already had. No, 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 no. Elijah's prayer, Elisha, I'm sorry, Elisha's prayer was that God would do something humanly impossible in that young man's life and allow him to see the unseen presence of God in terms of those horses and chariots of fire. You'll see that prayer makes possible what is humanly impossible because Elisha's prayer was for God to do something for the young man that was humanly impossible for him to do. We often forget that aspect of prayer. A lot of our prayers are for things that we can see that we can lay our hands on. But prayer is most potent 
when we are praying for stuff that only God can do. Listen, when you pray for someone's salvation, you got a relative, a friend that you're praying to be saved. You are praying for God to do something that is humanly impossible in that person's life. Only God can do it. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Y'all see that? We have been blinded by the world and by the enemy in terms of seeing the things of God so that a person cannot be saved unless God does something that makes it possible for that person to be saved, which means I have to be humbled to the point where I recognize that I'm not going to see it if God doesn't allow me to, if God doesn't make it possible for me to see it, I must realize that I am spiritually impotent. I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. So what have we talked about today? We have talked about the all-sufficiency of Christ. We have used an Old Testament passage to uh, show us exactly what that means. God is our all-sufficient resource in times of trial because he's omniscient, he's omnipotent, and he sovereignly protects his children. Secondly, prayer is the way to that sufficiency because prayer replaces panic with wisdom. Prayer, uh, number two, opens our eyes to spiritual realities, and prayer makes possible what is humanly impossible. 2 Kings 6, 8-23 Hope you've been blessed today. We have been on about, what, 50 minutes. Did have a little technical difficulty with this study. I had to break it up in two pieces because of something that happened. Hopefully all you saw was one piece, and I want to uh, extend my gratitude to Cassandra Sims for helping me with that. Church anniversary uh, this past Sunday. We thank God for that. Classes every Sunday at 1015 and 1130 for youth and adults respectively, prayer every Monday at 6, um, Bible study uh, today, and next, next Wednesday we'll begin a new study on parables, a new series of studies on parables next Wednesday. Terrific Tuesdays, Tuesday, May 3rd, May 10th, May 17th, May 24th. Uh, we've got Pastor Charles Goodman, we've got Pastor Kevin Adams, we've got Pastor A.B. Sutton, and we've got Pastor Clinton McFarlane. Food Bank opens Saturday from 10 till 12. Uh, okay, I think I've covered everything. On our prayer list, remember now, this was pre-recorded. I'm not teaching this lesson. I haven't taught this lesson live. I did it a few days ago. Prayer list currently, Dee Dee Billingsley, the Nidra Thrasher, the family of Sandra Thini, the family of Derek Winston, Tashia Winborn, Willis Jones, the family of Marlisa Kelly Johnson, uh, Latanya Cook, Thaddeus Taylor Jr., Leola Crosby, Clarence Bowling, Darren Williams, the family of Curtis Johnson, and uh, Teresa Curry. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word in the presence of your spirit. We lift up every name we've called, every circumstance they represent. We pray for providence, God, individually and collectively. Pray most importantly that your will be done in us as it is in heaven. We lift up our world, our nation, our state and city, God. So these are such tumultuous times for us, God. And we pray that you would help us to stay on track and remind us of the sufficiency that we find in you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I appreciate y'all uh, connecting. Remember, today's lesson was pre-recorded, although it was a new lesson. I look forward to a new study next Wednesday uh, as we begin a series on the parables. Have a great rest of the day.